The following podcast contains adult language and themes. Put the kiddos to bed. Fasten your seatbelts. It might be a bumpy hour, because we're going there. Taboo Topics are back on the table. Hey, I'm LeJohn. I'm Matt. And I'm Joe, and this is the Going There Podcast. One of the major things that we've witnessed over the last couple of decades with the advent of the internet and social media is online bullying and trolling, as well as our own public image online. And here to speak with us today is an amazing person, an amazing journalist, and somebody who is a public speaker who does a lot of TED Talks and things like that. Uh, I'll let her talk a little bit more about what she does. Miss Catherine Bosley, thank you so much for being here. Hi, oh, it's great to be here. Thank you. I'm so excited about your podcast and having this great group of you assembled for this. So yeah, I have been working in TV news for Oh, I hate to say it, but 30 years. <laughs> Impossible. She started when uh, she was two. Exactly right. right. <laughs> uh, a reporter anchor in a variety of, of market sizes. But most recently, I was working in Cleveland at WOIO. Uh, and so TV news was my dream since I was 12 years old. I remember uh, telling my grandmother, I was watching Wilma Smith, uh, my idol, and I told my grandmother, Nani, <laughs> do you think I could do that? And she says, I think you can do anything that you you put your heart into. And that kind of set the wheels spinning. So then all through high school, all through college, no, the grind so never straight. I had my my mind set on this, uh, this dream of going into TV news. And uh, once I finally got that dream job originally uh, right out of college. I realized how difficult it was. And in TV news, you move from city to city, leaving behind friends and family. You work crazy hours, holidays, weekends. And I can't tell you how many times I had to hide behind police car doors uh, covering standoffs with bad guys, knowing that bullets could start flying at any minute. And there's hardly any money when you start in TV news, um, contrary to what many people think. So, uh, I knew that if I worked hard enough and long enough, it would eventually get easier. And when I landed my job back here in my home state of Ohio in little Youngstown, Ohio, ah, yes, finally making some money, a uh, uh, um, great schedule Monday through Friday, finally getting on the anchor desks, so not hi- having to hide behind those police car doors quite as much and finally making a little money. Uh, I was, it was my late twenties, early thirties. Uh, I was so excited. It was my dream. My, my dream come true. So my last few years working in TV news in Cleveland, I'm on the set and I'm reading these stories about people who are taking their own lives because of, of cyber cruelty and uh, mostly young people. And every time I read a story like that, it just got to me because I know what it's like. It interrupted my career at its peak. And I remember feeling that way, wanting to kill myself because of of online cruelty. So as I'm reading these stories, I remember that when I was in my darkest moments, I promised God and myself that if I could make my story count somehow, some way, I would. And I'm reading these stories and I'm thinking, it's time. I need to do this story. I need to get out there and tell my story my way and use it as an example to others of number one, how in this day of digital everything, you have to be so careful. There's so little room for that. What was I thinking moment online or off before it could be stuck to you forever and for all to see, which is my keynote speech, the title of my keynote speech, but also more importantly, that online humiliation is indeed survivable. So I started to speak. I left my job full time, my dream job full time. And I decided I'm going to work on I got a couple of books in the works and I'm going to go go and speak. And it just took off like crazy. I did a TEDx talk and that kind of launched things. And uh, so it's it's been wonderful. I feel like 
for the first time in my life, I'm actually able to contribute to this society and make a difference with my own story. We'll get into the story here in a minute, but I think it was only amplified by the fact that you're already in a cutthroat. It's all about image. And so you broke into it. Yeah, you, know, you got a young, pretty blonde. I mean, it, that's exactly what they want in news. And that alone... Uh, the female reporters I've talked to, I mean, that is just so hard because you can't be 25 forever. And there's nothing worse than having your value be equated to the way you look on camera. Sure. I mean, that's important. And it's especially important on the female level. I mean, you can look at so often you see men who have been in the business for years who aren't necessarily drop dead gorgeous. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they look like that trash. They can be Us. just <laughs> Nobody cares, but a woman on TV, absolutely. I mean, the reality is that women are drastically scrutinized. Um, so that's something that we rarely address, but it, but it is the truth. So let me share a quick little story to intro this. I'm going to Kent State University. It's 2004. I'm taking a media ethics class. And actually, my professor... Uh, Jan Leach is one of our upcoming guests about media literacy. So we're taking a media ethics class and in the journalism world, and especially in Northeast Ohio, a bomb drops. There's a story that comes out that a Youngstown reporter, the salacious part of the story was like, oh, she does a girl's gone wild, crazy, uh, gets naked in Florida and flaunts around and goes wild on camera. And we were in media ethics, so we discussed that for at least a week. I think I even had to write a paper on it because we're, we are who we are. I think the teacher and some of the women were being more understanding. And a lot of people are like, you can't do that if you're in the news. What an idiot. And, you know, and it, and it was, man, I mean, judgment left and right. Of course, that's what we do as, as a society. We judge people without knowing anything. So years later... I meet Catherine, uh, working together, never put two and two together. And then I found out that that was Catherine Bosley. I'm like, she's the girl gone wild. She seems so, she seems so reserved and polite. So before we get into the full story, can you tell us what happened in 2004 that set this thing ablaze? Well, I got fired. <laughs> That's what actually set it ablaze. Uh, so here is the, the story. In my late mid thirties, I suffered two life-threatening illnesses. One, I went to the doctor because I had a cold and all of a sudden I'm having open heart surgery. Uh, apparently I had a defective heart, had no idea, went all my life with this defective heart that now threatened my life every day. So suddenly I'm having open heart surgery and I'm worried I'm gonna die. Get past that, get married. And only a couple of months after I got married, I was, uh, diagnosed with a lung disease. I, I went from running a marathon to a hospital bed, unable to speak a full sentence uh, without breathing treatments. And I had this growing bacteria in my lungs and no one could figure out why this was happening, what exactly the bacteria was, or if I was going to live. In our society, we hear somebody say, I went through this. And because it's not happening to us, we're like, oh, that sucks. And then we move on. But the yes. reality is, think about just what we've been going through with COVID. Imagine you had all of this happen in that period of time in the prime of your life as your career is taking off, you're getting married, and somebody going, you might not live another few years. That I mean, what was going on in, in your mind? Well, I think with the heart disease, it, it was just shock all the way around. It was just a matter of survival from day to day to day. And then it was oh my God, we made it through, I am going to live and then get married. And yeah, I met the peak of my career where I want it to be. And, but you know, it's when you go through something like that, I think anyone will tell you, it changes you. It makes you look at things differently. It makes you not want to be so reserved in life, but enjoy life um, and not be afraid of things anymore. It kind of boosts a, a courage, I think. And let me just tell you, I was a goody two shoes. I always did what I was supposed to do. I, like I said, I never strayed. Uh, I drinking was at a very minimum. I didn't start until I was well into college. So when you got these like diagnoses, were you like, I did everything right and I'm still being punished? 
It, it, exactly. And so, you know what, I'm just going to go live then the heck with this being, you know, so good. I, I want to go have fun and I want to cut loose. And then when you got, when I got walloped with the, uh, the lung disease, what happened to me was I decided it's okay. If I die, <laughs> I don't want to, but I found an inner strength that you didn't know you had with my uh, open heart. I say, I, I am a survivor. I had no idea I was a survivor. And with the uh, lung disease, I found faith. I mean, an inner strength of faith. I always thought faith was part of me, but until I went through that, I didn't realize how important it was. If I died, I was going to be okay with it. If I lived, then, you know, I've got so much more to be grateful for. So every day became more, more precious, more important, the people in your life, more important to spend time with. Yes, the career is great, but the stuff that's really important are your loved ones and your quality of life and, and enjoying your life to the fullest. You decided either in celebration of life or in screw it, you only live once to take a trip to Florida. Yeah, yeah, it was spring break 03. What happened was, yeah, I had just been told that I was going to survive. I was on, oh my gosh, thousands of dollars worth of experimental drug therapy, uh, including prednisone, which is a very interesting uh, steroid when you are loaded on it. It's been known to uh, cause impulsive behavior. So I've been put on it for allergies and other things before. And uh, my coworkers a few years ago when I was on it were all laughing because I was running around the, the building picking up these heavy things that like three people are trying to lift. Yeah. And and they're like, what is this? And I'm like, prednisone! <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. It's a steroid in many ways, yes. And so when they said that I was going to live, I was still on heavy medication, but we went to celebrate our one-year anniversary in Key West at the same time, got to celebrate that I was going to live. And we're walking down that main strip, that crazy Duval Street, and and I'm looking around and there's all the college kids and they're having so much fun. There's great music coming out of every bar. There's this beautiful breeze going over the island. And it, that's really when it strikes me. Life is good. I've got this second chance and I'm going to go live it to the fullest. I'm going to go do things now I would have never done before. That was really when that mindset struck. So I decided um, we walk into a bar that's going to have, of all things, a wet t-shirt contest. Never saw one. This goody two shoes. And neither had my husband. At least that's what he said. I don't believe him. Uh, I was going to say, your husband's (laughs) a liar. (laughs) So uh, we're in this place and suddenly this guy gets on stage and he's soliciting women to take part. And I'm like, I'm going to do things I would have never done before. Well, this would certainly top the list. And it's kind of like an out-of-body experience because I hear myself say, I'll do it. Yeah. And I did it. And oh my gosh, it got, I got caught up in the moment. Things got out of control. It really was meant to be more of a a moment between my husband and myself. The whole time I was there, I was just, I was watching him and we were laughing because this is so out of character and yeah, I was uncomfortable and I got really uncomfortable toward the end, but I'm a competitive spirit. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Kept going. Unfortunately. Um, (laughs) Prednisone. (laughs) Yeah. And you know, So I remember walking back to the hotel room in tears that I could let myself get so caught up in something like that. And uh, my husband felt bad too. And so we made a pact. We would leave it in Key West, um, learn from it, never do anything like that again. And back then we had those little flip phone things. We were just learning how to take pictures on. So I wasn't worried about anything like that. Yeah, If anybody was taking video or photos of you, it would look like Lego people building, building a wall. By the way, can we, can we see a show of hands of how many people have gone on vacation and never did anything that was regrettable or like a little gone wild, especially if you're outside of your area. Doing regrettable things is like my brand. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, it's, we're human, right? We're human. We all make poor choices and you do only live once you like to think, but in this day of digital, everything that we need to be more mindful that that reality and that desire to only live once and go have fun is something that could come with some serious repercussions. So the foundation of it all is the internet. And there were a couple of uh, people there from a couple of major websites documenting the whole thing with pictures and video. I had no idea. One uh, website was similar to Girls Gone Wild. And 
Apparently, 10 months later, mm, it got back to Youngstown and I found out that it got back to Youngstown on Christmas morning. Again, it was a year, the Christmas before was when my lung disease was at its worst. And I just got home from the hospital and we still didn't know if I was going to live. So that this next Christmas, we were all in celebrating. This is going to be a great Christmas. And I'm running around the house, getting things ready for a house full of guests. And I noticed that there's a message on the answering machine. And when I hit play, my life changes forever. I, I kept that message. I know that you have. Do you want to, do you want to go ahead and play it? Yeah, let's go for it. Hey, Rick and Catherine, or should I say Rick and Kathy from Kent. Just want to let you know that the video from Go Girls Gone Wild has hit the Youngstown area. You are being shown Catherine or Kathy from Kent, as you know. I guess that's your stage name. It's being shown from everywhere, from Channel 21 to Irish Bob to Royal Oaks Bar and Grill. Everyone's seen you in your full entire. Honey, your days are over. You think you're such a prissy little bitch, but your days are over. Have a very Merry Christmas. I think it's terrible that your mom talks to you like that. Yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Dominoes, just say you're going to be late. <laughs> I just found out about that when I went and watched uh, one of your TED Talks, where you shared that you still to this day have no idea who that person was. Uh -uh. <laughs> I don't know who it is. By the time this episode airs, it's going to be late winter. But when we're recording it right now, this is right around the time, the time that that happened, because this is Christmas time. Right. And, and there's nothing like embracing the holiday spirit like calling and leaving a nasty voicemail <laughs> on someone's mess hey merry christmas by the way exactly. i know you think you're a prissy little bitch <laughs> i mean think think about the money your day, but your days are over too you should know that <laughs> your days are over and merry christmas and can i say how i appreciate that she mentions irish bobs <laughs> because, yeah. because what the hell you're everywhere from channel 21 to my next door neighbor's basement like what is that uh, okay so she works at irish bobs we yeah. have that <laughs> at this point i don't really want to know who it is sure. i was on a mission though at first to try to figure that out i kind of feel like it's an inside job someone wanted to leave that message they didn't want to talk to me they wanted to leave that message and the more i listen to it the more i can almost tell it's kind of scripted I'm, she kind of stumbles over something and as an anchor i know what it feels like and how it sounds when you're actually stumbling over script so i kind of detect that and she left it on christmas eve and anyone who knows me knew back then that on christmas eve we went to my family's up up in ashtabula so i wouldn't be home have you ever seen the movie all about eve I don't think so. It's with Betty Davis, and she plays this old, st this aging stage actor, and this younger actress um, is a big, big fan of hers. So Margot's character takes her in, and uh, here we see that actually this woman Eve is trying to uh, get Margot and take all everything she sabotage has. her. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Who took over your position at yeah. Youngstown? Maybe we start there. Did, right. they, did yeah. they talk about right. Bob's Irish pub a lot? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know who left it. And I just I and and I wonder what she thinks now because I use that call because it, it really sets the stage and gives people an understanding, I think, of number one, the cruelty and and how it all began for me. When somebody unfairly criticizes you but especially attacks you and under the veil of anonymity. Yes. <laughs> there's just something so dark about that. Like somebody who isn't willing to say it to my face went out of their way to hurt me. Not to, not to like make a point to hurt right. me. Yes. On Christmas Eve. Yeah. Yes. That's an analog troll. Yeah. 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 <laughs> that, yeah that, they are like one of the original trolls. You yeah. got contacted by like the original internet troll. <laughs> yeah. Operating out of Irish bobs. Yeah. Right. <laughs> we have dial up. <laughs> I think that it's a good example of what, when we got today's trolls, they do stuff like that. So when you hear that coming from that phone call, when I speak, I hope that I raise awareness to how you sound if you are actually out there doing this kind of stuff, how it really sounds. It's not really an insult to say you think you're such a prissy little bitch. She's not saying you are. She's saying you think you are. Okay. And and then and I think that's a false assumption. So there you go. No, she's definitely all over the place. Yeah. And what is also just a shame is just how comfortable 
she was. I could never leave that, that message call. for anybody. No, I couldn't either. But now that we're on social media all the time, you do see people comment. Yeah. And say stuff that they would never. What she verbalized in that phone call is the same thing that people put out there in in, right. in comments and, and so forth all over social media every stinking day. I don't want to gloss over the point that you said earlier, and I hope that I didn't cut you off when you were saying it. To this day, it's been 16 years. It still affects you every time you listen to it. It does. And I, I say it. I, my heart sinks and I hate myself for a moment all over again. <laughs> You know. I really appreciate you doing that because, I mean, you really are allowing yourself to be vulnerable in that kind of discussion because you're allowing that pain to sink in. Yeah. And you know what? There is nothing wrong with being from Kent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What's up with the Kathy from Kent? Come on. <laughs> you know, personally knowing the story, I don't think there's anything wrong with what you've done. I mean, we've all been in situations where we're like, should I have done that? Like, I was trying to be in the moment and be fun, but we can all get caught up. If you're not doing something that's harming someone else, I just don't, you know, I just don't see it. But if we go back to 2004, it's Christmas Eve, you get that voicemail. How soon after do you get called into your office at Youngstown? So it was actually Christmas morning when I got it. Somehow we had to get through this party uh, with smile. Oh, gosh. Every, yeah. Uh, the next day I was off. Uh, so I went in and my boss was one of my dearest friends. And he's like, Bosley, what do you want? You're supposed to be here. And I said, well, I need to talk to you about something. He says, I need to talk to you about something too, because we got this big thing happening, this big story happening next week. And I want to make sure that you're covered. So it's great that you're here because we want to talk about that. I said, Gary, I need to quit. He says, oh no. And he sat back and I said, there's video out there of me. He just hung his head. He says, I heard about it and heard about it. And I tried to pretend that this wasn't real and that there, this doesn't exist. It had to be shocking knowing you. Knowing anybody in the news world, the Matt Lauer stuff was probably more shocking to a lot of people than like the Harvey Weinstein stuff, right? Yes, yes. Now, as a reporter, I will say, you know, even though I called myself a goody two shoes back then, as a reporter, I I stepped over the line a few times. You know, I I crossed some of those yellow tape lines just to get that interview and, and so forth. Uh, but but anything like this on a personal level was it was shocking to him. It was shocking to everybody. Oh, that's when I apologize and I will forever apologize. It will be for the disappointment that I caused other people that way. Did, did you want the station to fight for you? Did you feel like either they didn't and you didn't want them to to, to fight for you or did you want them to and, and, and they didn't and, and you, you really did want them to? All of, all of the above. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So when I went there at first, I loved that station. I loved the people I worked for. I loved the opportunities they gave me. I loved that they believed in me as a journalist. So I was so fearful that what I did would bring them down, would would ruin them. And so I went in there, yes, to quit. To And I thought if I quit, maybe whoever this person is on this phone call, you know, she wants me to quit. She wants me to be done. So if I got went back under the radar, maybe it would stop the whole thing. Lay low. And uh, he said, no, I don't want you to quit. I explained to him more about it. And honestly, he couldn't look at me. <laughs> he could not look at me. And I'll never forget that. But we're, we're not going to fire you. And I don't, we don't want you to quit. Let's take some time. I want you to take a week off and we'll decide what we're going to do then. I was thinking about ways maybe that I could work as a producer, maybe behind the scenes for a while or, you know, and then I got the phone call from my boss saying, I want your resignation now. It sounds like the tone was different too. Was it all of a sudden angry? Completely and angry, not my friend anymore. Uh, I was being fired, essentially. I, I want to go away from that station, not hurt it anymore on one hand. On the other hand, I've got a career. And I think, you know, if you guys, if you stand by me, maybe we could make absolute make this work. I would imagine that when I go on the air and apologize and explain what happened, suddenly we're going to get a lot more viewers. So it might have worked, you <laughs> yeah, know, but you, I, I think you did at least hearing your story, I think you did everything you could. And yeah. you not only fessed up to it right off the bat, and it's not like you, it's like, oops, I got caught embezzling money from the station. Okay, I might as well tell you. I mean, it's like, oh, I did something on vacation that I had no idea somebody was 
you know, going to videotape it and all this stuff. Very relevant. Yeah. So we all remember that story about the lady who sues McDonald's because she got burned by the coffee. And so, of course, as Americans, we go cold coffee. Yeah. Everyone's <laughs> like, oh, oh you know, an idiot. people are so yeah. litigious and blah, blah, blah. And then you learn the story about it. She tried to get what was supposed to be done correctly without suing or doing anything else in the way that they treated her. So in my ethics class, um, that was that was when Catherine Bosley popped back up the second time. Not only did she get fired, now she's trying to sue. And we're like, oh, what a litigious, prissy little bitch. But, <laughs> <laughs> so it's so easy to make those assumptions on the outside of it because you have no idea what's happening. And I'm not saying that everybody was super judgmental. You know, when you think back to that story, high level, it's like, oh, yeah, this person did something bad. And then they got fired. And then they tried to fight it because they don't want to own up to it. But that's not what actually happened at all you owned up to all of it you even you even tried to fall on your sword from the get-go i did and i never sued my station <laughs> i never ever ever sued my station right i had a lawyer reach out and try to get my job back and and i always will always feel bad about how that all turned out you also made national media and you were interviewed on good morning america good morning right? america inside edition i had my uh, bill o'reilly calling i turned down oprah twice it just became way too much you might be the only person who's ever said i've turned down oprah twice right, right. <laughs> that's a power play yeah we got to we got to tag at oprah on this one <laughs> there was one week where there was nothing. And so I got a phone call from a local radio station here in Youngstown saying, we heard what happened, Catherine. Do you want to come and talk about it? And I'm thinking, yeah, this will be my first chance to actually go public, let people know what happened and get it out from underneath me. I don't want it to hide anymore. I don't want to feel like I'm hiding it. I want to get out there and yeah, apologize publicly. And it was overwhelming, the response the positive response. I mean, the phone lines, I mean, they were just jam packed and people had so many kind things to say, similar to what you brought up. We all make mistakes. We all do crazy things. And aren't we so glad that even, you know, back then those cameras weren't there and that you, you know, that opportunity for that to be captured and now forever and for all to see didn't exist. So, so many people said, oh my gosh, when I was doing this, I'm so glad no one took pictures. People really were, were kind and, there were a few people that were belligerently cruel to. I mean, and for some reason, those are the ones you hear. Those are the ones, no matter how many kind comments come out, it's the ones that are mean that are the ones that kind of stick with you. Well, it's like when you're walking and you trip on something, you notice that you tripped on something, but you're not congratulating yourself for all those steps <laughs> that you didn't trip. Right. Yeah, that's exactly it. Did you yeah. get a lot of support? from places that you didn't think you would get, like like uh, friends and family that you never thought you would get support from? And then did you have friends and family that you just knew would be there and they were silent as hell? You know, I, I lost a couple of friends. And I think that the ones that I lost were surprised me. But yeah, people that came through, it, it was wonderful. It was, it was heartening. In your most darkest of hours, you find out how people really feel about you, for better or worse. That hurts, but you kind of appreciate, at least I know. Right. At least there isn't this facade of a friendship that actually isn't there. So in some ways, like you said, it's a gift. Yeah, and going through experiences like that, and you learn. You, I would have never thought that, you know, I'd be grateful that I went through an experience that would kind of filter out who are my friends and who are not my friends, but that's the reality. That's that's life, and as you get older, you you learn those things. So let's take a break for some music. And today we're listening to a really, really unique artist named Adron. That's like Akron with a D. Adron is making waves with her timeless yet wholly unusual musical styling. She just has a unique sound, a unique voice, and so much talent. Yeah, there's not a lot of conventional American sound in her music. It's something that you really haven't heard a lot of before, and even things that are similar. It, this is still so different, and I love it. She likes to create her own world in her songwriting and adds this real nice frankness to her lyrics. In 2017, she released Water Music, and she actually got to open for Steely Dan's Donald Fagan, and that's really cool. Adron recently released a song about my computer, which is featured in this episode. And uh, she's been performing virtual live stream concerts throughout the pandemic, 
trying to support her new material and just put some goodness out in the world. So check her out. I promise you're going to love this chick, Adron. Would any of us be able to learn if we didn't make those mistakes? Don't touch the stove, it's hot. And so there is nobody in this room who's like, I would never do any of these things. The fact is we all do things that create who we become. I have a guideline as to how I think I should act. And we always falter. But we know because we did this, I've said and done things that I'm so ashamed of, shame is one of the most powerful tools in your life. And not that you need to let it dig a deeper hole in you, but no, I should have never done that. And that and that makes me want to be a better person tomorrow. And, and so I think it's a beautiful thing that you embraced it. And, you know, I think feeling shame for what you did is one thing, but I wonder if all of those people, like that woman who called you and all these people who have these opinions and don't have the facts, if they feel shame. I know that I've done things that I feel shameful for and I know that I've said things or texted um, because I've been hidden behind, you know, an avatar. Joe, where were you in 2004? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I Listen, I was at Bob's Irish Pub. (laughs) Yeah. All I'm saying is (laughs) I'm so sorry. (laughs) No, but I, I mean, just I wonder how much shame that they feel because they're, you know, this has inflicted so much shame on you, but what they did was actually malicious and unkind. And even if they thought they were just being good Christians to call you up and let you know that you're not a prissy bitch, uh, that you're actually Kathy from Kent. (laughs) Well, maybe they had to experience something in their lives to look back and say, damn, that was really messed up what I did to her. Yes, John, exactly. You know what, Catherine? I would not be surprised if one day down the road, somebody reaches out and they're like, you know what? I left you a nasty voicemail. I don't know if you remember this. And you're like, I made a career out of that voicemail. (laughs) Yeah, you famous lady. It's ironic, isn't it? I mean, she gave me quite the gift. I just feel like if you've been signed for a four picture deal with Disney, you can be held to like some certain high standard. And I mean, I just don't think it's fair. I think you should be able to live your life. (laughs) Yeah. Well, it all turned out wonderfully. I mean, the end of the story is I had three federal lawsuits they were called Dream Girls. I don't want to get in trouble with Girls Gone Wild. This company was called Dream Girls. And another photographer who had a website who loved, had pictures like this of, of women being exploited everywhere. So we sued them. And what I got most, the most important thing I got was copyright ownership then to all of those images, the video and the pictures, which gave me control then to get, uh, to stop the dissemination and get as much of it off the internet as I, as I could. Uh, and it gave me then the power to take down Larry Flint when he decided to use one of those pictures that I've copyrighted ownership to. And we also sued the other TV station that was handing out the the videos. I, I feel like pornography needs to be one of our uh, upcoming episodes because there's so many different angles Please. on that. But there, <laughs> But there is a huge difference, regardless of your views on pornography and nudity and sex and all of these things, when it comes down to somebody doing it because they're being paid and because they want to do it. And somebody who is being exploited, that is a, I mean, there couldn't be a larger gap between those two things. Right. And Larry Flint's people knew that I had fought to get the copyrights that I went through another federal case to get the copyrights. So they knew they even admitted in the court that they knew that I was adamant about this, my copyrights. So we won. I mean, it was just, it was an incredible victory. And in the middle of all that, while I was fighting my way back, uh, Channel 19, they recognized what they called my resolve, and they gave me a chance to reclaim my career. And that's uh, WOIO in Cleveland. Everywhere. everywhere. Yeah. Honest, fair, and everywhere. Now, Catherine, here's, here's a hypothetical. Now, I, I know you were uh, uh, once an avid runner. I'm not sure if you still run at all. Time goes on. We find out exactly who that woman was, 
And she owns up to it like, yeah, bitch, I made that phone call and everything. I left the message. And then there's an opportunity to have a celebrity boxing match. Yeah. <laughs> you and her. Are you taking it? Sure. Am I for it? <laughs> yeah. I'll be pumping, pumping those weights. Here yeah. we go. It's going down. I will train you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, even, even the person who uh, was my friend at the other TV station that kind of led this project of spreading the video, uh, broke my heart that she was sitting on the other side of the table during our lawsuit. And she felt that I was doing something horrible to her. And <laughs> they always do. <laughs> I love that Joe laughs at that. Well, no, I'm, because I'm the in people... shock. Like who, what brings you well, to like, this point? And she's, she's but that's laughing. Why, yeah. Because it's like the woman who called you, why are you so upset that this person who has nothing to do with your, like all of these people who cast judgment, like they're more concerned with your life than what they're doing with their life. It's the old proverb of uh, drinking poison and hoping the other person dies. Yeah. The people who spend all of that energy, that negative energy, like I can't wait to see this person fall. It has to be from a place of jealousy, whether it's career, uh, you know, vanity, whatever it is. The only way that I can, it, it's like they think that they are being, their rights are being taken away. Yeah. Like their right. their t shirts are being wet now. Yeah. <laughs> How dare you? Like, <laughs> yeah, she may as well have said, I never signed on to do a wet t shirt contest. How dare you do one? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe she wanted to, yeah. There is a double standard. I truly believe deep down that if a man in your exact same position had done something similar. Obviously, no one cares if a men's men are doing wet t-shirt contests. No one cares. Um, <laughs> but if a man had done something like that and was exploited, I personally think it would have gone a very different way. Without a question, it definitely would have been a different way. I mean, it's just it's just how women are perceived in this in this world. You're allowed to be sexualized, but you're not allowed to be sexual. You exactly. actually need yes. to be sexualized to achieve things. Right. <laughs> yeah, but it, it can't get to a point where we think that you feel empowered by it. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that funny? But then as soon as you do something that just kind of says, you know, okay, I am a sexual being. Then, oh, how dare you? Right. And it, it's, you know, there's a hypocrisy. Absolutely. Bullying and trolling are, are nothing new. Uh, you know, every time the media changes, we find a new way to use that to do that. What does that do to somebody? So after I did my radio appearance about it, then that's when it became national news, actually global news. I had people from uh, the UK calling to interview me. I, the phone wouldn't stop ringing. People uh, in the, in Europe were probably like, what's the big deal? Were, yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. We don't understand. Is it because you put your clothes back on? <laughs> yeah, I know. We want to know why this is a problem. Yeah. Good morning. America kept calling me and I said, no, 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 no. Then they're calling my husband. He said, no, no. And then Diane Sawyer herself called me. That's when it became so huge. And that's when the pictures and the video, this is before I had copyright ownership, before I could do anything about it. It made it, it just made it magnify. And so comments were pouring in on websites. Uh, I went be viral before we had the term viral. I, uh, on, on major search engines, I topped the likes of people like Britney Spears and Paris Hilton. Yeah, I, I was above them. And thank goodness Janet Jackson took the pressure off of me. When she <laughs> oh, yeah. So, yeah, going from website to website and people commenting and commenting and commenting. And so many of them said I was stupid and ugly. I had no reason to live. Eventually that stuff gets to you. I mean, if you're seeing it come at you on, on your cell phone, on not so much your cell phone back then, but on your laptop, and it is painful and you believe that the whole world is piling on and that there is nowhere to escape. And it got to the point where people would drive by our house, honking their horns, yelling terrible things out the car window. The only escape I could think of was, as I said in my TED Talk, was what was in that bottom drawer, which was a whole bunch of leftover pain medicine serious stuff that could take care of me. I read about that, that bottom drawer and I have things that still remind me on purpose. And I want them to remind me of where I was in my dark place and everything, because I looked it in the face and it made me stronger and I, and I saw it through. Do you still keep them in that bottom drawer? Uh, yeah, I still have them. Um, I still have many of the medications, but I remember those nights I'd go to bed and I would think tomorrow will be the day. Right. So, and it's just very, painful to re recollect those kinds of feelings. A couple of times I went running and people would follow me and yell things. I had my mace in my hands. I was worried for my safety. I bet. 
Uh, and then one time I was out there and I was alone and I'll, I'll never forget. I mean, I, I, there were no, it was in a park nearby where I live, a beautiful park where, you know, we always could hear the birds and see the squirrels even running around in the winter. There was nothing. It was dead silent. I could hear my feet and I just felt, I couldn't, I couldn't run anymore. I couldn't take another step. I just fell to my knees and I promised God if I could just get through this, if I could somehow make it count for something good in this world, you know, if I could survive it, I would do that. And so that kind of stuck with me. And as I made that promise, I was able to, to get up and get moving again and realize that I could have, there could be some empowerment from this somewhere if I could get through it. This is unfortunately a common bullying and trolling tactic, which is you should kill yourself or you have no reason to live. <sighs> that sinks in. I mean, you actually start to believe that narrative, right? When I was going through it, we didn't understand cyberbullying and the whole mental impact of it. And I think my family caught on to the fact that maybe my life was in jeopardy and they talked me into seeing, talking to a psychologist. I went to the psychologist and she had me fill out this questionnaire and the questionnaire had questions like, do you think people are watching you? Do you think people are talking about you? Do you think you want, people want to hurt you? Yes, 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 yes. And so then she goes and she sits in her office and she's kind of grading this questionnaire and she comes back out and she leans over. She goes, your, your diagnosis is that you're paranoid schizophrenic. <laughs> it's like, have you seen the news lady? <laughs> to go even deeper psychologically, you hear it enough. Not just the fact that I've, I don't have anything to live for and, and doom and gloom and things are over, but did you start to believe the narrative that you had no worth, you had no value? Absolutely. And that, you know, I thought it would be this bad forever. That sure. it, and that's what forever and for all to see. And someone saw me in Kinko's and started running after me with their cell phone to a, a, a shock jock was on the other end uh, saying, you should talk to me. You should talk to me. I put those pictures up first in Youngstown. I'm the one that gave you this fame on the air saying Catherine Bosley is at Kinko's and Boardman. Everybody go there, go there, go there. And I had to jump in my car. I'm calling my husband. All this stuff happened in a matter of two days and I'm bawling and I'm looking at this tree. I'm going to slam my car into the tree. This is my only answer. I told him that on the phone. I, I, I can't do this anymore. And he's like, please come home. I'm going to open the garage door. I'll be right out there for you. Because I felt like literally people are chasing me now. Uh, so it was kind of a fight or flight time then. Uh, so when you ask me, you know, you were having, all, you think there, there's no reason to live because people are saying this. I have a choice, slam my car into the tree or come in with my husband and make a phone call and try to look for a way to fight. And so that's kind of when the fight began. Catherine is sharing a deep, deep wound to allow yourself to be vulnerable remotely too. Um, I want to show my appreciation by sharing that I have been that guy who was in the darkest of places in his life. My job was horrible. I had just lost a close friend I was working with to cancer. My marriage was towards its bitter end. I saw no way out and I'm sitting in rush hour traffic and several days in a row, I thought if I just drive off the bridge, that would solve a lot of my problems. Obviously, I never even jerked the wheel or, or, you know, took the first step. That wound is still there. You know, it's it may have healed up, but you got a scar and, and you remember how you got it. Yeah. You know, it's one thing when it's environmental or, or simply psychological. It's a whole other ball of wax when it's people who are putting you in that spot. And sometimes mm -hmm. it's yourself. Yeah, and that's why, Catherine, I got to give you so much credit because uh, you've heard it many times before about how strong you are and how strong you had to be to see it through. But that, that's a whole different set of circumstances that you probably, one, of course, never thought you would be involved in, and two, didn't think in any kind of way that you can even get towards the end of it, and yet you did. Yeah, you've had three near-death experiences. Yeah, right. And so, like I said, with the heart disease, it was our survivor. With lung disease, it was faith. And now with this, it was courage. I never knew I had courage. Yeah, I've certainly been um, in places where mentally I felt berated as well as been the person who perhaps inflicted that and I feel bad. And sometimes I even wonder, like, what is the logical way out of this pain? Looking at it logically, because things seem so dark at that time. But if you just keep pushing through, 
you're, you know, the dawn will come. That's the human experience as we tell ourselves to avoid as much pain as possible. But then when you start getting into therapy and you start doing self-discovery, you realize the pain is actually what defines you in the end. And so reading that on the wall at my therapist's office when I went in there in those dark days and it said, the point of this is not to avoid the storm. It's about learning to dance in the rain, getting through it. And then you look back and you're like, you know, in some weird way, as you've already said, shit, I'm happy I lived through that. I'm happy I went through this. Yes. If yes. these people who troll are causing these suicides, is there a way that they can be held accountable? And if they were held accountable for somebody's death, would they stop trolling? Right. But so I become a, a semi expert on some of this. And you find cases where, indeed, if, if someone uh, is, told to kill themselves and is taunted and taunted enough it, it is technically yes cyberbullying and it is jail time it's punishable i mean it could it can be you can end up with manslaughter charges yeah i mean it's almost it you need to for it to stop at this point cuz people aren't going to just be kind there are there are cases yeah uh, commonwealth v michelle carter was about like text messages emails phone calls that led up to someone's death. I think I remember that. Yeah. I mean, if you search, you'll find that there's a lot of cases like that. So I think that we're slowly, the law is really just not catching up with the technology. They've always struggled, and especially in media law, because the internet is is this, it's the ether. And it's like, okay, where do you sue someone? Like, where did this take place? Does it take place where the server's at? Does it take place where they live? Does it take place where the victim lives? And it, it becomes this messy area. And the the fact that you can do these things anonymous is what really makes it problematic. It also what is what makes it encouraging for people. You're desensitized. You would how often would you go up to somebody's face and say that? Never. Yeah, and when you're texting something or writing something on a computer, that message is getting to a person who's behind that screen, but you there's probably some psychological disconnect. Oh, it's not real. Yeah, you're yeah, it's not real. And then when it happens to uh to celebrities and they they sound off on it suddenly it's at least it's giving it a little bit more of a real face like the celebrity who's getting this it's not it's not just someone who's online it's a real person who's who's feeling this i think a lot of people are able to compartmentalize and say they're not real people yeah. they're a movie cover they're right. not a human being with feelings and everything else. They need to make a computer that looks like a human face when you start to type something nasty on or like, it. <laughs> anytime you start to write something nasty, a picture of your grandmother shows up like looking at you real <laughs> yeah. sweet and dear. That's true. Wouldn't that be great? I think that's... You're uh, like, you Nani, no! <laughs> You're like, All right, I mean, yeah. backspace, backspace, backspace. Yeah. <laughs> I was talking about ducks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. That's, I mean, that's it's true. And I just think that... I don't think that this this is going anywhere anytime soon. I think this is just going to keep as it is. And right now, some people are really bored. They're spending so much of their time online. And and so I think that it's kind of at its height. I had another principal reach out to me the other day saying the the cyber bullying is getting out of control. Can you help us? It, it's very alarming. The core of this show is built around trying to coexist and give each other a little bit of space. You know, we don't have to agree on everything. But we should definitely all agree on just be kind to each other. And it's certainly yeah. don't be mean to somebody for no freaking reason. It's just a completely undeserved thing. So I guess my question is, what do you say to the people who are out there right now who are being bullied or have been bullied and are in that dark space where they've been looking at the bottom drawer? So in retrospect, I, I narrow it down to what I call my PACT strategy, an acronym uh, as far as how I survived. So P number one, people, you've got to turn to your people when you're going through something painful, right, John, you got to, your yes. people, Yes. especially with young people, they're embarrassed about it. They're ashamed about it. So they take that cell phone into their bedroom and they hide with it and they don't tell their parents or their siblings or their best friends. They just sit there and they just soak it all in and it just becomes so much worse. Your people are your army. And LeJohn calls them his Avengers. Yes, this is true. Sure. That's very true. Absolutely. They are my Avengers. I guess what I'll share is for the people who are in that place and that mindset, putting it out to others doesn't make it more real. If anything, it helps take away that pain. It helps other people take on that burden with you. Right. And, and, and it allows a chance for a different perspective on it. 
you know. So uh, A is for abandon, stink and get away from the source of cruelty, whether it's closing shop on Twitter or another social media platform, even in your in your real life, maybe getting away from the social group if they're causing you angst. It's only going to make it worse. You can't operate in a toxic environment or relationship. Nope. Get out of it. Abandon. Uh, C is connect with professionals who can help you as well uh, when it comes to cyberbullying altogether. There are so many websites out there with support groups. There are counselors. There are There's law enforcement. There's lawyers. There are so many professionals there in this incredible movement to, to bring an end to uh, the, the torment. And, uh, and T, oh, this is my favorite the, for my pact. T is for this too shall pass. You know, um, you guys have all been through something in your lives that you thought was going to be the end of you, right? Yeah, yeah. Tomorrow will be better. Not only did you survive it, it makes you stronger, wiser, and now more equipped to help others uh, in your life who find themselves uh, going through similar circumstances. So this too shall pass. You're going to rise. You're going to become a better person from what you're going through. And Mm -hmm. you need to embrace it. So I think we can pact our way out of anything. Yes, we can. I, I love that acronym. We'll, we'll definitely have to tag and share that like crazy. Mm-hmm. Um, the minute you took the focus off of you and you put it onto how can I get something out of this that's beneficial for other people, people suffering from depression, people considering suicide, people who it seems so impossible to make it to tomorrow. The minute you take the focus off you, and it doesn't mean you've been selfish. It means how could you look at anything else? Right. But the minute that you go, maybe I should go help a friend do this, or maybe I should have a conversation with somebody about their problems. Suddenly, your problems aren't taking up all of your space and all of your all of no, your it's mind. A resume space. builder. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you started thinking about how I can help others, and selfishly, that helps you. Right. True, it is. <laughs> so I was just going to say, as selfless as it seems, there is also a selfish element to it. It does it makes you uh, feel stronger and feel like if you if you are giving back, there is no better gift than to be able to give back. So I've got this. So I'm going to use it, and I'm going to be selfish, and I'm going to use it as much as I can. Awesome. I love that. I love it. And hey, listen, and if none of this works, we just go down to Bob's Irish Pub and get drunk, right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, they keep playing the same Girls Gone Wild on loop, but you know, whatever. Yeah, the VHS tape has worn out. <laughs> Is there anything, any sentiments that you think that we haven't touched on that you really want to make sure that uh, resonate with people? I just want to make sure that people, as much as I talk about the survivability of it, I also talk about how you can protect yourself from becoming someone like me. And that's just about being more mindful now about everything you do. Uh, Everything you do, not only online, but you are vulnerable all the time. And you've got to think about everything that you're doing. Understand when you're taking pictures at a party, you know, what can be done with those pictures that are being taken of you, what, what you could be doing to other people when you take pictures of them being silly. And now you decide to put that out there online. Think about consent as a key word here to make sure that you don't hurt other people. Get their consent to take the picture, number one. Number two, get the consent to post that picture so you know you're not hurting someone else. Yeah, it's unfortunate that that's where we're at, but it comes down to controlling your own narrative. Yes. Other people can can control it for you. So you had, I mean, there's a reason I don't take a lot of photos. You know, somebody once joked, Matt, I've never seen a picture on your Facebook where you're not holding a drink. And on one end, I go, man, that probably makes me look like an alcoholic. On the other hand, I'm like, the only time I'll let people take pictures of me is at holidays when everyone's got a drink in their hand. So I'm like, you know what? I'm, I'm okay owning that. But you have to be okay owning it. And, and there's just some things I'm not okay owning. And I'm not going to tell people, don't go get in a wet t-shirt contest. What I want to tell you, though, is understand if you do, the ramifications that can come from it. It's just we need to be aware of the risks. I am certainly no one to tell anyone what to do. And I am not, and I am no prude. I just, I, I just want people to understand so they don't end up finding out the hard way uh, just how real the, this, this pain and destruction can be. If you're okay with having a bunch of pictures with alcohol, and if, it, then that's fine. Just understand that when, understand Matt, that when you, <laughs> you go get a job somewhere else, or God forbid you're ever on the dating scene again. That you- actually helped me when I was on the dating scene. <laughs> it's like, this guy looks fun. Uh, so Kathy from Kent, where can people find you? 
Yes, KatherineBosley.com. Please go in and, and check in there. You can find me on all the major social media, on Facebook, on Twitter, on uh, on Instagram, and on LinkedIn. I love LinkedIn. And I, I, I follow back. Follow me. I'll follow you back. As well as YouTube. She has her uh, TED Talks, some of her public speaking events, which you even remotely now are getting. You get booked year round yeah. like crazy. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I got uh, certified as a as a virtual presenter, so that that kind of helps. And uh, so, yeah, I speak everywhere from from the high school level up to the college level, and even to uh, CEOs and at corporate level. Because your own you know, any business is you're just as strong as your weakest link. And if you've got someone who's out there being so irresponsible with their social media, it's not just about them. Uh, it, it comes back to being about you too. So it's really important to make sure that your employees understand the responsibility that is held with everything that you put out there. Are you happy that the internet and social media and stuff weren't around when you were growing up? Oh, yeah, I think so. Because I am. I, I, I think so. I wish... I, I wish that we could limit, can we just stop? I mean, stop the progression. Technology is wonderful on one hand, but it was great when you went out and you played kickball in the backyard with friends, or you just kind of had a night of watching movies or something like that. You know, it was, it was an easier time. And I think a more, a deeper time where we were, became deeper people. You know, we weren't kind of just mesmerized by, by that social media stuff. So, yeah. I just know that if, any of my, especially younger, more, I don't know, naive and or just ignorant days, if I had put my thoughts and photos and events out into the world and be judged on those things, <laughs> in some ways, I really feel bad for today's youth because there is no privacy. You know, we would pass each other notes and those notes got destroyed. Yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Not today. No. That is, I mean, I. there is no privacy. There is no privacy. And it's not just about your images, everything. Now it's about your online images, everything. For someone to experience what you experience and, and, and harken back to what I went through, just to, to see the outcome and I can just truly feel your spirit and your strength seeing it through. I really appreciate your, your, your candor and, and coming through with that. So thank you. Thank you. Right um, back at you, John. Oh, right back you. at you. I mean, we're we're the same that way, my friend. I appreciate that. I'm going to keep it real simple. Every morning before I went to school, my mom would, all right, John, have a good day. Think, think, think. She said that every single morning in regards Aww. to the decisions that we make. Because before you do anything, you have no idea how that can impact your day, your week, your month, your year, your life. Think, think, think before you do whatever it is you do. Because there you it, go. Could, it could alter some things that you don't want to have altered. And, uh, and I think about that, I'm 37 to this very day. I think, think, think. And I tell my kids the same thing. So, yeah. It's a wise mother. Indeed. Yes, indeed. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your story and taking something that um, most people would want to hide and deny and blame other people and owning it and growing from it and helping other people um, who I'm sure you've impacted so many lives for the better because of this situation. Something that my mom always used to say to me when I would go to school was uh, be nice to somebody who no one is nice to. And uh, I think that that's something that maybe we can all try to do too. <laughs> it's really easy to bully and judge. Uh, Psychology Today says if you're critical about someone who has a different lifestyle than yours, it might indicate that you have underlying doubts about your own lifestyle. So before we cast judgment, you know, let's, let's look within. Let's just try to be kind. Very wise beyond your years. No, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> You're an adult, obviously capable of making your own decisions and judgments. But had I been in your spot, I would have gone even more crazy and not regretted an ounce of it. And so I hope there's the part of you that still says, yeah, OK, maybe it got out of hand, but it's life. And we say it all the time. Life is messy. And sometimes messy is a wet t-shirt. <laughs> <it's> exactly that. <laughs> yes. As you would imagine, I'm very mindful about when I wear a white t-shirt. <laughs> yeah. So there, there, there's a fine line between being a, a strong person and needing to survive. I think there's a fine line between that. So uh, I appreciate that people think I was strong 
and so forth. But I think it comes back down to, I needed to survive somehow. And so I found a way. And I think that a lot of the way I found was through God too. He, he sent me in this direction. So I will always go back to saying anything that I've accomplished, I, I credit God for. I think the world is a much better place since you did. Thank you. Thank you so much. And God bless you guys. And you guys have a rocking show. I love I love the dynamics with your group. So keep it up. Merry Christmas. I will leave you a Christmas Eve voicemail okay. <laughs> from Bob's Irish Pub. And I'm just going to make sure it, it, it blows the other one out of the water yes, in your mind. Please. And so you can say, I got the best Christmas Eve voicemail. <laughs> but share with the world. That's yeah. right. <laughs> I want to be in your next TED Talk. Thank you so much, Catherine. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know. Maybe we're all screwed. And thank you again to Adron. You can check her out on Patreon at patreon.com slash Adron and Adronical on Instagram. We just went there. Now we want you to go to Instagram at the Going There Podcast, Facebook at Going There Podcast, or email us at going there podcast at gmail.com. This podcast is made possible by its hosts and Frame One Media in association with Lindsey Baker, Tyler Kubisti, Michael Madgar, Joe Kelly, and Bobby Thomas. 